Well, today we're going to talk about preparation, and I have to admit that I think my style of preparation is different than other people's. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's a fairly subjective thing, isn't it? I mean, are you prepared? A couple of years ago, I felt like God put on my heart uh, two things to focus on. One is to be prepared, and actually the word before it for me was responsibly prepared, and present, and the word before that was fully present. So I felt like God had put it on my heart to consider ways to be more responsibly prepared and fully present. Now, there are some people who don't have to make that a goal. (laughs) And they're quite different from me. Because uh, I tend to be one of those people who kind of, you know, just in time. J-I-T, as my mom uh, uses the acronym, just in time. Like, I like to be prepared. It's something that's important to me. Um, I feel like it's a high value. But my style of preparation is likely different than others, and it tends to be just in time. And there are a few people in this room right now, including my family, who know exactly what I'm talking about um, because they live it all the time. Now, I tend to uh, function pretty well in that that, uh, realm, in that zone, But it's an area of growth for me, for sure, because I think if I had just a time, you know, if it's just in time, maybe one one big breath right before, just in time, like if I could do that. There is, um, I'm I'm one of those people, and if you're a person who's well-prepared, well-planned out, I think about my dad. My dad is like uh, the opposite of that. Uh, He is super mindful about time, and he's ready on time, and he's ready a bit before, and um, I really, really value that about my dad. And I'm sure through the years, my tendency to be just in time has bothered him probably a little bit. Uh, So I want to be like my dad in that way. Um, I think I'm different from God in that way. I've been thinking about how God is, what, what does it look, what is God's preparation style? And when we look through scripture, we can see some pretty good indications about his style of preparation. In fact, we know, and we mentioned it last week, that all the way back in Genesis, God was preparing his people for the Messiah, even in talking in the garden with Eve. And all of this expectation uh, for the Messiah to come uh, was something that God was preparing people for. He is good at preparing his people. We talked last week about a coach and how a coach, a good coach, is mindful of his or her team, individuals, and collectively to prepare them. And so what's the coach, what's God been doing as a good preparer through the generations and generations leading up to this time of year that we celebrate, when Jesus' birth is on its way. We're getting ready, right? We're lighting candles. We're hearing some Christmas songs, even if they have to do with Santa Claus. Uh, Very different from Jesus, by the way. Let's just keep our minds on that. But uh, we are expecting, we are anticipating, as Christine was saying with Advent, we are anticipating and we are invited to prepare. So how is it that you prepare? like maybe for a test, students, or a paper that's due. How do you prepare? Um, How about uh, adults maybe for a presentation for work, or even just for your day? How is it that you prepare? And is this an opportunity for us to think about how God invites us to prepare, not just logistically, but preparing preparing our hearts? What's that like? So we're going to go to a story in the Bible, and I'm going to take a little different track today in our sermon. Try something new. You know, here at Oasis Church, we're not really interested in just doing things uh, when we like to try different things. And so we're going to try something a little different. I'm going to share a story with you from God's Word. That's not different, right? But the way we're going to do it is a bit different. So I'm going to share a story with you. And what I'd like you to do is really play close close attention to uh, some of the details I want you to listen to this story as if you're going to retell it to somebody else. And this is your one shot at hearing it. That means if you need to take a couple notes or for Oasis kids out there, you need to draw a picture so that you can um, lock it in your mind. I want you to think about how you would retell this 
story, okay? And it comes from God's word in the book of Luke. There was a man named Zechariah. He was a priest, which meant that there was a certain time of year where he and his division of priests would go to the temple to worship God. And uh, he was kind of at that time um, with his division going to serve the Lord. And he was chosen by lot. It's like, uh, you know, uh, what do we do sometimes? Drawing of straws. I haven't done that for a while, but that's kind of how uh, the Hebrew, ancient Hebrew way of discerning what God's will was. And so in his division, they um, cast lots and the lot fell to Zechariah. And so Zechariah was the one who was to go into the inner section of the temple to burn incense in this really important opportunity to worship the Lord. And so Zechariah was in the temple, the sanctuary of the temple, and he was uh, doing what he was dutifully to do, when all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, an angel appears. I mean, scared the guy to bits. He is so afraid, he's terrified because of the, the majesty of this angel that's in front of him. And the angel says, Zechariah, don't worry. You don't have to fear. It's okay. And he proceeds to tell Zechariah a very important message, because that's what angels do. They're messengers of good news. Now, let me back up a second. Zechariah has a wife. Her name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth is born in the, uh, of the daughter, so in the genealogy of Aaron, who was the brother of Moses. So he was the first high priest. He was, in the, he was the first priest. And here's Zechariah. She marries a priest um, so that, uh, that that lineage continues. And Elizabeth and Zechariah were faithful people. They were dutiful in their relationship with God. They honored God in everything that they did. But they were not able to have children. Elizabeth was barren. In that day, that was maybe considered something, well, maybe something's wrong there. In fact, women would often be mocked if they were barren in her culture. And they were advanced in years, Zechariah and Elizabeth. All right, so we're back here in the inner sanctuary. This angel starts talking to Zechariah. And the angel says to Zechariah, you and your wife, she's, she's going to have a child. She's going to bear you a son. You're going to name him John. And John is going to be really uh, important. John is going to have the Holy Spirit living inside of him, even from his mother's womb. Now, John will live a different life. He's to not have any alcohol or wine, any strong drink. And he is going to have great favor in God's sight. He's going to be a mighty man of God. And he is going to help prepare people for the Messiah. Now, this would be amazing news, right? But Zachariah starts thinking, well, what? I mean, <laughs> we're old, Zachariah says to the angel. I'm an old man. My, my wife, she's beyond years of childbearing. And the angel, you can almost picture him crossing his arms, and he says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, dude. No, he didn't say dude. <laughs> I was sent to you to give you this message. And the one who sent me can handle it. He can do it. And Zechariah, because he's kind of looking for some evidence, like how is this going to be? Show me how, give me a sign. Oh, and Gabriel is ready. I'll give you a sign, Zechariah. You will not be able to speak until these things I've told you have come to pass. So at that point, Zechariah is no longer able to speak. Now, there were people outside in the temple area, outside of that area that he was, and they had been praying. The multitude, the people had been praying. And they'd been wondering, what's taking Zechariah so long? So when Zechariah comes out and he can't speak, they realize that he has had a vision from God. He can't speak. Can you imagine being Zechariah, trying to explain with hand signals about an angel that you just encountered. <laughs> that must have been kind of interesting. 
So Zechariah finishes his time of serving in the temple along with his division, and then he returns home. And what do you know, Elizabeth becomes pregnant, and she waits five months, sort of in seclusion, treasuring the fact that God had chosen her and them for this important endeavor. All right, there's the story. It's from Luke chapter 1. And uh, there's a lot of really cool things happening. Honestly, I think it's a story out of God's word that we sometimes jet past because we move on to baby Jesus. But it's what happens right before Jesus, and it's one of the ways that God is preparing his people, and he will be preparing his people through John. So here's what we're going to do. Like I said, we're doing something a little bit different. Now we're going to take a moment, and we're going to sort of think back to that story. We're going to kind of rebuild it in a way. And so what I would like you to do, we're going to give you two minutes, whether you're at home um, or with other people, home by yourself or listening by yourself or with other people, I want you to sort of rebuild this story. So either jot down what you heard, what you remember from beginning, try to think at the front end of the story to the end, and we're going to give you two minutes. And I would love for you to comment on the uh, Facebook about what you notice what you remember happening. And it's okay if you miss some of it. In fact, I probably missed some of the details. So we're going to come back and dig in a little deeper. So give you a couple minutes to do that. We're going to have that conversation here among the five or six of us. And uh, go ahead and do that at home. And we'll be back in just a couple minutes. All right, a uh, couple minutes is up here. Hopefully you spent some time rebuilding. Let's look now. If you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to open to Luke chapter 1 because we're going to go back through this and see what we missed, see if there's anything there that we uh, didn't know. I actually am going to grab my phone and let's see what people have commented. We just got into such a great conversation here on this end of things that we— uh, that I kind of forgot about that. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and write in some things that were happening in the order, and if, if possible, in the order which happened. Uh, what are some things at the front end of this story that were going on that, uh, that you noticed? So go ahead and comment. I know it takes a couple seconds here to get people to comment, but let's remember some of these details of what's happening here in Luke chapter 1. One person writes, a miracle shows God's power and God's plans he has for each of us. Yeah, absolutely. All right, what else are we noticing here? And I might have actually a couple of different feeds that we have going on because um, we're posting this in a couple different places. Is there some here? Okay, thank you. All right, so what do we have? All right, he sees an angel. Yeah, Zechariah sees an angel who tells him that he would have a son. Zechariah's disbelief of the message Gabriel delivered, it, it didn't seem possible. Absolutely, it did not seem possible to him. What else do we see here? He's serving, uh, he's serving in the temple courts, right? He is um, serving God, and all of a sudden, yeah, this angel surprises him to bits. Uh, I can almost imagine him passing out, maybe... Gabriel needed to tell him to take a couple of deep breaths. We don't have quite all of the details of the conversation. All right, so they're having this uh, conversation, and let's just go back to Scripture and see what we've got here. Okay. All right, I I forgot to mention, in the days of Herod, okay, so he's king of Judea, there was this priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he and his wife um, from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God. It doesn't mean they were perfect, okay? It means that they were dutiful, that they were obedient, that they, they desired to be devoted to God. And that's important to note so that the argument could not be made that she was barren because of sin, okay? Because in that day, I suppose it was hard to know why someone wasn't able to have a child. We know some things about that a little bit more now. Uh, But she's not able to have a child, and they're both advanced in years. 
Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, which about two weeks a year, uh, a division would take on that responsibility um, of serving the Lord as the custom of the priesthood was dictated, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing, I guess I missed this part, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. I missed that when I shared that. Man, you've been praying all of these years, Zechariah, you and Elizabeth. And right now, and the people, I'm listening. Your prayer has been heard, the angel relays to Zechariah. I'm sure that was incredibly encouraging, but I'm, she, he's still in shock. Your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And that's not a family name. We'll read about that a little bit later in Luke. In fact, when they want to name him John, the people are like, what? That's not in, you're not supposed to do that. No, there's clarity. I was told, Zechariah will later communicate. I was told his name is to be called John. Verse 14, and you, Gabriel says, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Not only will you be really glad to have this child, but many will be so excited. They will have joy. They will um, celebrate with you. For he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And you're going to hear about that next week when Mary comes to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth has John growing inside of her. And John, well, I don't want to skip too far ahead, but you can tell the Holy Spirit is moving in John's life, even as he's growing in his mother's womb. Every time I look up, I lose my place. So here, I got to go back. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. And he, this is so crazy. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him, meaning the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Oh, there's so much going on here. Now, Zechariah had been studying God's word. He was a priest. He would have known the law and the prophets. The Old Testament prophets have messianic prophecies. They have spoken about what will be true of John. Zechariah would know this. So then when Gabriel says, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. If you rewind to Malachi in the Old Testament, it's the last sentence in the Old Testament. This is what it says. And I have to imagine that Zechariah's brain would be like, wait a minute, what? I've been, I've been reading about, studying about what will happen when the Messiah is about to come. And that there's going to be somebody like Elijah who is going to prepare the way. Listen to what Malachi 4 says. Behold, again, this is hundreds of years before. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. There is someone coming. Zechariah, it's your son. Big plans here. Rather specific plans here too. He will be that one to prepare the way of the Lord, the Messiah. And this, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. By the way, that word disobedient isn't like, it's not like lawbreakers, okay? It's people who have not yet been convinced of who God is. Who have, who have not, who have been skeptical. He's going to turn those people's hearts back to the Lord or to the Lord for the first time. It's a pretty big job. And then that last part, to make ready for the Lord a people 
prepared. Now we've been using that word prepared a little bit this morning. That's what John is going to do. He's going to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Okay, verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. He's skeptical. Prove it, he says to Gabriel, which takes some guts. And the angel answered him. (laughs) So in our house, I don't know if you've seen the movie uh, or movies, Guardians of the Galaxy. If you haven't, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about, which might make you want to go watch it. Okay, there is this character. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Anyway, I know Tara does because we've been talking about this. Um, There's this character in Guardians of the Galaxy. Raise your hand if you guys have seen Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, good. So everybody in our tech area. Okay, Um, (laughs) very good. So there's this character in Guardians of the Galaxy who who can only speak uh, three words. Okay, and what is it? What does he say? I am Groot. His name is Groot. He is a really cool character, by the way. And that's all he can say, but he uses different tones, different uh, ways of expressing those three words that help communicate a message. And I just can't help but think of that when I hear about how this angel Gabriel, okay, after he's questioned, like, are you sure? And, And Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. (laughs) <laughs> I'm Groot. Okay. Anyway, move on. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Gospel, by the way. Same, same word. This good news. And behold. Okay, so I'm here to give you good news. You're going to question it. All right, let's go. Here's what I'm going to do to show you that this is the real deal. Here's your sign, Zechariah. And it's going to be a little opposite of what you might think, which, by the way, is God's tactic quite often, I've noticed. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words. You didn't trust them. There was a trust issue going on for Zechariah. You didn't trust them, so you won't be able to speak. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has, gone, has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. That is how God works, by the way. We talked about that with the woman at the well. God is good at doing amazing things, like removing reproach from people, from taking stories of brokenness and pain and redeeming them, returning to them healing where there's brokenness. That's, that's the God that we're talking about. That's who he is. But let's just make sure that we don't miss anything, particularly in verse 17, around this idea of being prepared. Because that seems to be the number one item on John's not even yet born position description. He's going to prepare a people. He's going to turn the hearts of those who have fallen away or don't know me to me. That's God's plan. That's God's purpose for John. He has work to do through John to prepare people. And the Gospels will go on to talk about what happens with John as an adult, as he is indeed preparing the way for the Messiah. He is not the Messiah. God is going to do miraculous things through him. But what is it that the Messiah is going to do? I'm going to turn to Isaiah 61, because here's another prophecy about Jesus, the one we're going to be talking more about next week. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. That's our God. He wants to bring freedom where there's captivity. He wants to bring healing where there's brokenness. He wants to bring assurance where there's fear and doubt. He wants to communicate to people that he's real and that he's present and that he's available and that he's willing to listen and that he's here to rescue. That's our God. So why is it important that John prepares the way for Jesus so that people's hearts are ready to receive him? And by the way, it's not just John's job to prepare the people for the Lord. It's a pretty critical calling for John, but I believe that calling is not just for John. It's for those of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We are called to prepare the way of the Lord. So I don't know how you prepare for a test or a paper or presentation for work or for the beginning of your day or how you prepare to go to sleep at night. I want you to do some thinking about that. To take note of the fact that there are intentional things that we do to prepare for what's to come. But there's some intentional opportunity for us in this Advent season to prepare for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just him coming thousands of years ago in Bethlehem, but for his return. Because we are people who believe that Jesus will return, as scripture says. And he will make things that are broken fixed. He will, he will make things that are wrong right. He will... He will bring freedom in everlasting way. Like he's doing it now, okay? There's kind of a here and now and then and there in the future. Right now, God's on the move. And he's doing miraculous things, things that only God can do. We talk about only God stories in Oasis Church. And he's doing things right now that only he can do. In this city, and whatever city you live in, he's on the move. And he wants to use you to prepare others to accept and to receive him. That they might just not know him intellectually, but that they might know him. Now, I don't know if you've been watching the numbers regarding COVID-19. But this last week, um, I mean, there's some good signs potentially of uh, numbers going down some, but if you've looked at the numbers of deaths, and I'll just talk about Iowa for a minute. In the last week, there has been a massive spike in deaths related to COVID-19. It, it's like ridiculous. It's, it's... But death is not just new to COVID-19, as we know. Death is real. And we're not promised tomorrow. I have a Facebook friend whose brother committed suicide this week. There are people in our lives who don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, who have not experienced a personal relationship with him that caused them to know that they are loved beyond measure, that they are graced beyond capacity, that they are, um, that they are known just as they are and love just as they are. They don't know they have the opportunity to be under the loving, caring, intentional coaching of God so that they might not just experience eternal life in the, in the after, but now that, that eternal life starts now and it lasts forever. That they might know freedom now, that they might understand their identity in ways that they've never before because of what God says about them. There are people dying, some rather quickly, some a slow death without the hope of Jesus Christ. And guess what? You have been called up. Gabriel and the rest of the hosts of heaven and God himself says, I am, God says, I am and I call you. Now I want you to go and prepare the way. And where you struggle, where you're fearful. You know, Zechariah, I don't blame him. He was scared to death, almost death. He was scared to bits. We might be kind of scared about that, that, that God calls us to go help people know Jesus. 
well, what if they reject me? What, what, if, uh, what, if, they ne- what if they never um, want to talk with anybody about God again because they have such an awful conversation with me that they're completely turned away? I mean, I don't know if you had that fear. I've had that fear. And so we hesitate. But let's remember who prepares. It's God who prepares. And God who is preparing people to hear and experience a relationship with him. So then we just show up. Kind of when we go back to the woman at the well story that we told a couple of weeks ago. Where Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. Let's go. Let's go. Let's bring in the harvest. It's not your job to grow it. It's not your job to mature it. It's not your job to keep it healthy. It's God's job. He's the one doing it now. I'm preparing you that you might help people experience him. It's like God is just saying, okay, just put your name in the blank. If you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, put your name in the blank. And he says, I'm just going to bring people to you so that they can talk with a real human being that's flesh and blood. Maybe it's in, uh, at school. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's, uh, and, and just tell them about who I am. He didn't even need Zechariah to use words. Do you, do you notice, uh, I guess I was thinking about this, how baby John, as he grew in his mother's womb, never heard the voice of his earthly father. That's something. We know a lot now about how babies, as they develop, they hear their parents or their siblings' voice. So much so that after they're born, they recognize that voice. I have um, a friend who has a daughter who, uh, who lost her hearing as an infant. So she's unable to hear, but they believe that because of the, the, the ability she had to hear as she was growing in her mother's womb, that that impacted her ability to be able to uh, understand words and understand uh, conversation and be able to learn, uh, because she she lost her hearing as an infant, but kind of crazy. Anyway, another story for another time. God was speaking to John, preparing him. The Holy Spirit was moving. And if God can do that, he certainly is doing that in your life and in the lives of the people around you, that they might know him. And we are invited, like John, to help prepare a people to know him as Lord and Savior. Well, I, uh, I hope that you feel sent <laughs> and that you count on God to have prepared you and will prepare you. And then present, prepared and present in our, in our sermon series is something we're getting to yet. But God is present in the midst of of whatever it is that you're going through, and he promises to go with you. So with that, I think we're going to pray, but I do want to just mention that we have some discussion questions that I would encourage you to think through personally or have some conversation around after this morning. So they're going to be going up. I think we've got them here on the screen right now. And then uh, we'll put those up at the end of the service too. Maybe you want to take a quick picture of them and have some conversation around that over lunchtime. But God is on the move, and uh, he desires to speak into our hearts, and I hope that the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and the people and John have impacted you greatly as we prepare for the birth of Jesus. Let's pray.